So what's all this talk about sprung versus unsprung mass in cars? You've probably heard these terms thrown around in the past, maybe by someone or some company saying how such and such a part will reduce unsprung mass in a car. But what do these terms really mean, and should you really care about them? Hello, I'm Hubert Mace, and this is Suspensions Explained. For the purposes of suspension design, the mass of a vehicle can be divided into two parts, the sprung mass and the unsprung mass. The sprung mass is all of the mass that is sitting on the springs. In other words, if you were to remove the springs, how much of the car would fall down? The unsprung mass is all the rest. An easy way to visualize this is to bounce a car up and down on its springs. The parts of the car that are moving up and down are the sprung mass. The parts that are sitting still are the unsprung mass. You can see here that the whole body is moving up and down. The body, the interior, the engine, the fuel tank, all these things are moving up and down as I bounce the car up and down. Conversely, it is easy to see which parts are standing still. The tires, the wheels, the brakes inside the wheels, none of these are moving with the body. But there are a few parts that are special cases. They are neither completely moving with the body nor completely standing still. Look at the suspension control arm. Part of it is moving up and down and part of it is not. The parts of it that are connected to the frame are moving with the body, but the part that is connected to the knuckle is not. The same for the steering tie rod. The part that is connected to the steering linkage is moving with the body, while the part that is connected to the knuckle is not. So how do we deal with these parts? They are known as partially sprung parts. And based on the percentage of the part that is moving versus the percentage that is not moving, we can divide their mass between the sprung and the unsprung mass. By the way, it's not really critical that we get these numbers down to the last gram. The calculations are pretty rough anyway. Let's look at an example of a partially sprung part. Most lower control arms have a ball joint connected to the knuckle and two bushings connected to the body. Based on that, we would estimate that about one third of the arm is unsprung mass, and about two-thirds is sprung mass. Similarly for the tie rod, one end is on the steering gear, which moves with the body, and the other end is on the knuckle, so we would estimate about one half of the mass is sprung and the other half is unsprung. Any other part of the suspension gets treated the same way. If we had a driven axle, for instance, then we would have a half shaft, and we would include half the half shaft mass as unsprung mass, and the other half as sprung mass. The damper, though, is a bit of a problem, because only the rod and the valve inside the damper is connected to the body. And estimating how much of the mass is in the rod and the valve is a bit tricky. So we guesstimate that about a third of the damper mass is sprung mass and the other two thirds are unsprung mass. It gets us close. The spring and damper have another issue though that we need to take into consideration. And that is that they may have something called a motion ratio. What this means is that as the suspension or the body moves up and down, the spring and damper may not move in a one-to-one -one relationship with either the suspension or the body. It depends where the spring and damper are attached to the suspension. In the case of a McPherson strut, for instance, the spring and the damper are connected directly to the knuckle, so there would be a one-to-one -one relationship between the motion of the suspension and the motion of the spring and the damper. In that case, we would take the two-thirds of the damper that we talked about earlier, and we would take half the mass of the spring and add it to the unsprung mass. The rest of the mass goes to the sprung mass. In a double wishbone, on the other hand, the spring and the damper are rarely connected directly to the knuckle and are often connected somewhere along one of the control arms, most usually the lower control arm. This means that as the suspension or the body move up and down, the spring and the damper move up and down as well, but a little less than the suspension or the body do. Something like this. The difference is called the spring or damper motion ratio. It's easiest to see if we overlay the suspension in the two positions. In the model shown, the knuckle moved 40 millimeters up, but the spring only moved 30 millimeters. This means the motion ratio would be 30 divided by 40, or 0.75, or 75%. Our unsprung mass calculations need to take this motion ratio into account in calculating how much of the spring and damper mass to include. If the motion ratio is 0.75, then we would take half of the spring mass as we did before, then multiply that by 0.75 to get 3 eighths. We would then take 3 eighths of the spring mass and add it to the unsprung mass. The rest of the spring mass would go to the sprung mass. 
Similarly, for the damper, we would take the two-thirds of the damper mass we did before, multiply it by 0.75, and add that to the unsprung mass. The rest of the damper mass would go to the sprung mass. Before we finish our discussion on unsprung mass, let's go through an example to see how this all works. Here is a fictitious car with a double wishbone suspension. The mass of each part is shown as well as the motion ratio. For most of the parts, like the knuckle, the bearing, wheel and tire, the motion ratio is 1 since these move directly with the suspension. The control arms are shown to only have a third of the mass moving with the suspension, and the spring and dampers have a motion ratio of 0.75. If this were a McPherson strut, the numbers could look like this. Notice how the upper control arm mass is now 0 because there is no upper control arm in a McPherson strut, but the motion ratio of the spring and damper are both 1. You can see how the unsprung mass is dominated by things like the wheel and tire and the brakes. The rest is fairly light in comparison, so whether you include one third of the control arms or a half really won't impact the end result all that much. And this is why carbon fiber wheels and carbon ceramic brakes are such a big deal. Reducing the mass of these parts can have a major impact on the unsprung mass. Okay, so now that we know what sprung and unsprung mass are and how to calculate them, we need to talk about why they are important. When you want to calculate the stiffness of the springs, you need to remember that the springs are only holding up the sprung mass of the car, not the entire mass of the car. If we were to use the entire mass of the car to calculate the stiffness of our springs, we would end up with springs that are far too stiff. We need to subtract the unsprung mass from the sprung mass in order to make sure our calculations are correct. Secondly, when a car travels down the road and encounters a bump, the wheels, tires, brakes, knuckles all get pushed up by the bump. But we just learned that the stiffness of the springs is determined by the sprung mass, not the unsprung mass. So if there is a lot of unsprung mass, the spring and damper won't be able to keep up when a bump sends all that mass flying upwards. What happens then is before the spring and the dampers can get that mass stopped and pushed back down again, the tires can momentarily leave the ground. If this happens while you're braking, the tire will momentarily not be able to provide a braking force. If this happens during acceleration, the tire will also lose traction and start to spin. If this happens during a corner, you will lose cornering force and the car will skate or dance to the side. Some of you may have encountered this before. It used to be a much bigger problem years ago when live axles were more common because of their huge unsprung mass. Today, with independent suspensions being more prevalent, it's much less of a problem. Still, for really high-performance cars and race cars, reducing unsprung mass is a priority, and manufacturers are willing to spend a lot of money and time on it. That's why in those cars, you'll often see things like carbon fiber wheels and carbon ceramic brake rotors. They have other advantages as well, but reducing unsprung mass is one of the prime reasons for using those technologies. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please hit that subscribe button and notifications, and we'll see you next time for more Suspensions Explained.